Though it has not been the capital of the United States for over two centuries, the city of New York is the biggest city in the U.S., with nearly nine million residents. The megalopolis exerts significant influence on the sectors of world trade, finance, media, art, fashion, research, technology, education, and entertainment. New York cannot be disassociated from its skyscrapers, which make the Manhattan skyline easy to recognize. But Manhattan was not always the district it is today. The High Line is a suspended urban park spanning a length of 2.5 kilometers. It was created on an elevated section of the disused railroads built in 1930 to remedy the massive congestion and numerous accidents of the meatpacking district. The brick and metal structure, characteristic of 19th century architecture, is typical in this residential neighborhood. Manhattan also contains many rather old churches. St. Paul's Chapel, built around the 18th century, is the oldest, still standing church in Manhattan. The Trinity Church dates back to the 19th century. Of neo-Gothic design, it was like a lighthouse for boats arriving into New York's harbor. But Manhattan is above all equated with its skyscrapers, including the very famous Empire State Building, which tops out at 443 meters, if you count the antenna located at its peak. It was the highest building in New York from 1931 to 1973, until the inauguration of the Twin Towers at the World Trade Center. It was the highest skyscraper in the world until 1967. The Empire State Building is an Art Deco skyscraper, and it is considered as one of the seven wonders of the modern world. It is one of the best-known symbols of New York, even though today it seems lost within the forest of Manhattan skyscrapers. The Chrysler Building rises only 319 meters to the top of its arrow. It is the favorite skyscraper of New Yorkers. Also built in Art Deco architectural style, its characteristic peak is made of stainless steel tiles. Another must-see site of Manhattan is Times Square. Nicknamed the crossroads of the world, Times Square is one of the famous and busiest sites in the world. Over 350,000 people pass through it daily. It owes its name to the fact that it was formerly the location of the New York Times newspaper. Theaters, showrooms, and music halls abound in Times Square. Famous names like those of Fred Astaire, Charlie Chaplin, and George Cohen were associated with the area in the 1910s and 1920s, the time of Broadway's golden years. Then, Times Square changed with the beginning of the Great Depression and during the 1930s. It developed into a neighborhood full of prostitution, porn cinemas, and cheap souvenir shops for tourists. Rehabilitated in the late 20th century, Times Square became the Agora of New York, a place to meet and congregate. This area constantly buzzes with activity at every hour of the day and night due to these giant shops and massive billboard advertisements. Another major site in Manhattan is Fifth Avenue. It is to New York what Oxford Street is to London or what the Champs-Élysées is to Paris, one of the most famous and best-known avenues in the world. Full of luxury boutiques, the avenue is one of the main symbols of the city's affluence. The most prestigious brands own a boutique here, or even an entire department store. The commercial section of Fifth Avenue is listed as the second most expensive place on earth in terms of commercial real estate after Sloan Street in London. Not far from here, the Rockefeller Center is a complex of commercial buildings built by the Rockefeller family. It is made of 19 buildings that contain many shops and theaters. Many seasonal events take place on its plaza, like ice skating and the massive Christmas tree, which draws in thousands of people every year. The Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, also on the avenue, was inaugurated in 1929. 
Rockefeller Jr.'s wife decided to create an institution devoted exclusively to modern art and young artists. Today, the museum welcomes over 3 million visitors per year. It has one of the greatest collections of modern and contemporary art alongside the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris and the Tate Modern in London. Van Gogh, Picasso, Matisse, Hopper, Warhol, and many others are viewed by the public here. The Metropolitan Museum is the greatest art museum in the world. Open to the public since 1872, it numbers over two million works. The first 172 works were brought by the founders. The donations and various acquisition policies transformed the site into a temple of culture. Still on Fifth Avenue, the Guggenheim Museum is a museum of non-figurative painting. Opened in 1959, it numbers around 6,000 works. The museum itself has a spiral design. Visitors enter from the summit, then progressively go down a slightly inclined ramp. Manhattan would not be Manhattan without Central Park. It has a surface area of 341 hectares. Completed in 1873, after 13 years of construction, Central Park is like an oasis of greenery among the forest of Manhattan skyscrapers. With 37 million visitors per year, it is the most visited park in the United States. It is also a protective zone for the fauna, for the migrating birds, and small mammals. Its natural aspect is the result of major landscaping works. The park contains footpaths, ice skating rinks, open lawns for outdoor sports, and many man-made lakes. It is definitely a good spot for relaxing and for getting away from the city's bustle. With over 350,000 visitors per year, the Chateau of Giverny is one of the most visited chateaus of the Loire Valley, along with those of Blois and Chambord nearby. An older chateau was raised in 1630 to begin the construction of the new building, designed by the architect Jacques Bougier, with a very classical style. The Chateau of Giverny has belonged to the same family since its construction, the Hureau family, who were financiers and officers in the service of several kings. Ornamented with busts of Roman emperors, its facade is made from a local stone that has the characteristic of whitening and hardening with age. With a beautiful symmetry, the chateau is part of the list of historic monuments. In the dining room, the Italian-style coffered ceilings reveals the fashion of the times. The monumental neo-Renaissance-style fireplace is gilded with fine gold and topped with a bust of King Henry IV and the coat of arms of the family whose descendants still live in the chateau. All around, the walls are hung with Cordova leather that is also decorated with the emblems of the Hero family. The room is decorated with 34 wood panels illustrating the history of Don Quixote, painted by Jean Monnier, an artist recommended by Queen Marie de Medici. The furniture notably includes a beautiful china cabinet made of solid oak, which faces the fireplace. The stone, classical-style grand staircase that leads to the apartments rises at a right angle, not a spiral. Dating from the time of King Louis XIII, it is ornamented with war motifs and rustic sculptures, with garlands and fruits carved directly into the stone. The largest room in the chateau is the armory.
It displays a collection of weapons and armor from the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. The furniture notably includes a trunk covered with Cordova leather that had belonged to King Henry IV, and a beautiful tapestry from the 17th century depicting the kidnapping of the beautiful Helen by Paris. A gallery has a collection of family portraits, including that of Philippe Hureau, the founder of the chateau, and his wife, Anne de Thou. Among the furniture, a small chest of drawers signed by Riesner, a famous cabinet maker of the 18th century. Another chest of drawers with red tortoiseshell marquetry in the boule style from the time of King Louis XIV is found in the tapestry salon. A beautiful clock called the Three Mysteries is still in working condition. The Grand Salon was the reception room of the chateau. The furniture dates from the 17th and 18th centuries, and family portraits are sprinkled across the marquetry decorations of the walls. The seats are covered with Aubusson tapestries. The original ceiling, matching the decoration, was restored in the 19th century. Nearby, the chateau's library, with wood-paneled walls, holds over 2,000 works, including complete collections. Its accessories make one feel the ambience of a bygone era. But while the Château de Cheverny is cherished by the public, it also served as a model for Hergé, the creator of the famous comic strip Tintin, for the invention of Marlin Spike Hall, the home of Captain Haddock. Since 2001, a building has contained a permanent exhibition on the works of Hergé related to Marlin Spike Hall. Essentially, it concerns reconstituted interior decorations of the monument with sound works and models. The park and gardens stretch out over nearly 100 hectares around the chateau and are accessible to the public. The whole thing is divided into three parts, a French garden, a vegetable garden, and a more natural English park. The vegetable garden was designed and created in 2004 by the current Marquise and combines original uses of different materials, colors, vegetables, and flowers. The Garden of the Apprentices is also newly created, inspired by the discovered plans for an old French-style garden on the same site. A vine reminds you that we are in the region where the wines of the Loire are made. And redwoods and many varieties of cedars crown the English park. A large pathway leads to the Orangerie which now holds congresses, seminars, and marriages in a beautiful green setting. There's also a waterway on which you can go canoeing. And the forest is an ideal place for a walk in the fresh air. The fact that the Chateau de Cheverny has belonged to the same family for more than six centuries is certainly not unrelated to the great coherence of the site. Each generation has made its contribution to the maintenance and embellishment of the building.
In Madurai, a city of one million people in the southern state of Tamil Nadu, the Hindu temple is at the center of the network of streets. They serve to facilitate the processions that took place during the religious celebrations. Its gateways, called Gopurams, were used as landmarks that were visible from a distance. Sri Manakshi Temple numbers 12, with the highest one rising 52 meters. The Gopuram delineates access between the real world and the world of the gods. The temple is in Dravidian style. The Dravidians were people of South India, in contrast with the Northern Aryans. It was built between the late 16th and the early 17th century on a surface area of six hectares, enclosed by many surrounding walls. The Gopuram is a high portal tower made up of many stories. It was of great interest to all the builders and decorators of the time. It is loaded with over a thousand representations of divinities, demons and mortals, with pillars and gargoyles. The entire structure is extremely but not overly colorful, painted in pastel tones with plays on light. The temple, located in the middle of the enclosure, generally attracted less attention, artistically speaking. According to Hindu religion, all living beings have a soul. For certain sects, this soul is indistinct from Brahman, the supreme being. The ultimate goal is for an individual soul to be identical to the supreme soul. In other branches of Hinduism, Brahman is the unattainable supreme being. He's also named Vishnu, Brahma or Shiva according to his aspect since it can be declined in various forms. The temple of Madurai is devoted to Minakshi, the wife of Shiva. In the numerous corridors of the labyrinthine temple, vendors sell icons and sculptures of divinities from the Hindu pantheon. Light filters in through openings in the ceiling. The temple includes a profusion of sculptures on the walls. There are more than 33,000 over the entire holy site, including those on the Gopurams. The temple is thus devoted to Manakshi, the wife of Shiva. The daughter of a king, in her childhood she had three breasts. A voice from the sky told the king to not worry about this anomaly and that the third breast would disappear as soon as she would meet her future husband. Later, after having confronted and beaten Brahma and Vishnu, she presented herself before Shiva and her third breast disappeared immediately. A statue depicts her wedding to Shiva with her son Ganesh, the elephant god. In one of the numerous halls of the temple, a golden mast symbolizes the human spine, a symbol of energy. A masterpiece of Dravidian architecture, the temple is among the most visited holy sites of India. It attracts more than 15,000 visitors daily. Just beside it, Putu Mandapam is also a must-see. It is an old abandoned temple built around 1650. It has been converted into a textile market. Despite this, its frieze has been maintained. In an old colonial building, a secondary school reminds us that in India, between 70 and 80 million school-aged children do not attend school. And yet, over the past few years, school has become obligatory. But given the extent of poverty in the country, some parents prefer an extra salary in the family. India is also the country of palaces. The Palace of Tirumalai Nayak, designed in part by an Italian architect, was built in 1636 for the eponymous sovereign of Madurai. He was a great patron of the arts and architecture. Under his reign, many buildings were erected. The center of the palace is occupied by a big rectangular courtyard surrounded by vaulted arcades rising 20 meters high. These are supported by monumental pillars, a characteristic of Nayak architecture. 
There are around 248 pillars that are more than 17 meters high with a diameter greater than 1.5 meters. The decoration of the vaults is remarkable. It displays a meticulous work of stucco and gold. This palace is a fusion of Dravidian and Islamic styles. Originally, the royal complex was four times greater than what can be seen today. Upon the death of the sovereign, his son destroyed most of it to use the encrusted jewels and precious wooden sculptures in his own palace. It was restored by the English in the 19th century. A staircase in this courtyard gives access to the celestial pavilion, which measures 75 meters by 52 meters. It is the former throne hall, and it has an octagonal shape. The vast cupola, which peaks at a height of 25 meters, is supported by huge columns. Another room that still stands today is the Natakshala. It is a former performance hall, 22 meters wide and 42 meters long. Today, it has been converted into a museum hall. Here, too, the arcades are magnificently decorated in stucco, a marble powder that lends itself to creating the most sophisticated moldings. The gigantic size of the room lets one imagine the former splendor of the 17th century. Lago de Carioca is a great pedestrian square. This vast space is considered by many as the heart of Rio de Janeiro's central district. It used to be a marsh along which stood tanneries, but it was dried up. In the 1970s, nearly all the old buildings were demolished, and the centro now welcomes a great number of business headquarters. Businesses have set up their offices in these skyscrapers, which are true jewels of modernist architecture. The biggest campuses of the country's major universities and municipal buildings have also established themselves here. The district also includes a great number of hotels, theatres, movie theatres, street markets and cafes. Overlooking the square, the Monastery of Santo Antonio contains one of the oldest churches of the city. The entire complex dates back to the early 17th century and the church was modified in the 18th. The building's long facade includes many square and widely spaced windows, which indicate how old the building is. The quirky stone bell tower shelters three bells. At the entrance, there is a niche with a statue of St. Anthony and a few decorations soften the site's austere feel. The interior is Baroque and the central retable is also dedicated to St. Anthony. On the side stands a sculpting of the Immaculate Conception and of St. Francis of Assisi. Just beside it stands another church devoted to St. Francis, which was built 50 years later in the late 17th century. At the church's entrance stand sculptings of the 18 Franciscan monks 
who were martyred in Japan, which had just been discovered then in the 17th century. Its interior is considered as one of the most exceptional examples of Baroque Brazilian art, and it holds great artistic and cultural value. The altar and walls are entirely decorated with gilded wooden sculptings, created by two of the best Portuguese artists, Manuel and Francisco Xavier Brito. It's an incredible combination of arabesques, coils, bodies in movement, and other various decorative elements. The paintings on the ceiling represent the glory of St. Francis, and they are the first paintings ever to be included in a Brazilian church. Entirely restored in 2002, the church has become a museum of sacred art. The Church of Candelaria is another major historical church of Rio de Janeiro. Construction began in 1775 and lasted over a century. The story of the church's foundation is nearly legendary. It started in the 16th century when a boat called Candelaria suffered a storm at sea and nearly sank. When they arrived in Rio, the surviving Spaniards ordered the construction of a chapel to honour the promise they had made during the storm. This small chapel, devoted to Our Lady of Candelaria, was since replaced by the current church. The church combines the Baroque architecture of its facade with the neoclassical architecture and neo-Renaissance elements inside. The magnificent mural paintings, the polychromatic coverings in Italian marble and the German stained glass windows make it one of the most beautiful churches in Rio. The São Bento Monastery, which includes the Church of Our Lady of Montserrat, is one of the oldest monasteries of Brazil. Located in the historical center, it was founded by the Benedictines in 1590 and it still houses 40 or so monks today. It's one of the main monuments of colonial art within the city and the country, and it hints at mannerism. The funds necessary for construction came from the revenues gained by the sugarcane production in the numerous properties owned by the monks. The church's interior is very luxurious. It's entirely decorated with late 17th century Baroque style gildings and Rococo elements from the second half of the 18th century. One of the greatest Brazilian Rococo sculptors, Ignacio Ferreira Pinto, worked here for 10 years. He preserved paintings depicting the lives of the Benedictine saints, which had been painted 100 years earlier by the German monk, Fray Ricardo de Pila. Inside the church, there are also seven lateral chapels, each more decorated than the next. The Cathedral of St. Mary in Toledo is one of the largest Gothic cathedrals in Spain. The construction work began in 1227, 
and it has the distinct feature of having been built according to the French Gothic style. It wasn't finished until the 15th century, by this time with Spanish style additions. Its facade is magnificently sculpted and decorated with statues, and it opens onto a portal with three doorways that have very elaborate timpana. On the interior, the layout of the cathedral is inspired by that of Notre Dame in Paris, adopting a structure with five naves. Its choir, separated by a screen, is certainly one of the most beautiful out of all the European cathedrals. A beautiful French Gothic sculpture from the 14th century presides over the altar. It's called the White Virgin. The clergy sat here in wooden stalls dating from the end of the 15th century, on which are depicted episodes of the recapture of Granada from the Muslims. On the backrests of the upper stalls, the prophets are sculpted in wood. The upper portion, in alabaster, also bears statues of the prophets. The multi-lobe arches around their faces could reveal a possible Muslim influence. Facing the choir, the main chapel spreads out in all its splendour, topped by the agony on Mount Golgotha. The 25-metre high altarpiece that lines the background is in the polychrome flamboyant style. It relates the life of Christ down to its most minute details. Hundred and twenty meters long, the main nave, supported by eighty-eight pillars, rises forty-five meters above the floor. It contains another emblematic treasure of the cathedral, a spectacular thirty-meter-high Rococo architectural grouping created by Narciso Tomé. Among the characters it represents are the Virgin and Child, and at the summit, the Virtues. At the centre of this altarpiece, there is the glory in the form of the sun, surrounded by archangels. Surrounding the nave, several chapels compete for space, including the Chapel of the Conception, created in 1502. The decoration is an example of the transition between Gothic and Renaissance art. The Chapel of the Epiphany also dates from the same era. On the altarpiece, various sacred figures are surmounted by the crucifixion. Beneath the choir, several small chapels or altars also honor several figures of the Catholic religion, which, at the time of the reconquest of Spain, had a great need of pedagogy in order to make people forget the Muslim religion that came before. On the side of the cathedral, a door opens onto the cloister. For its construction, the archbishop bought the entire adjacent Jewish quarter. He had it raised and the first stone was placed in 1389. The first frescoes that covered its walls have disappeared over time, and in 1780, they were replaced by a new series on the lives of the saints of Toledo. Amongst others, Saint Eugenio and Saint Casilda appear there. Saint Julian and Saint Ildefonsus frame the door of the chapel of Saint Blaise. In the centre of which there is the tomb of the Archbishop Pedro Tenorio, who began the construction of the cloister and that of his secretary. Around the cloister, there are several rooms that also serve as libraries.
The chapel of the new monarchs contains the sepulchres of the kings who reigned in the 15th century, including Henry II and Henry III. Another octagonal-shaped Gothic-style chapel is dedicated to Ildefonsus, one of the first defenders of the virginity of the Virgin in 657. The sacristy of the cathedral has now been transformed into a museum of religious art. It was built at the end of the 16th century. Standing out in the background, there is the painting of the expolio that El Greco painted in this very spot in 1578. This division of the robe of Jesus earned recognition for the painter who had just arrived from Spain. Another masterpiece that is one of the treasures of the cathedral is the processional custodia. It's a two and a half meter high work of goldsmithery made in 1524 by the German Enrique de Arfe. It's made up of 5,600 pieces held together by 12,500 bolts and it contains 250 small statues made of enamel and gilded silver. Its pedestal is made of solid silver. This custodia represents the tower of the cathedral and it's topped by a diamond cross. With all of its treasures, the Toledo Cathedral has been listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1986. The Bayan not only incarnates the creative genius, but in particular, the oversized ego of the legendary king of the Khmer Empire, Jayavaram VII, who had it constructed at the end of the 12th century. The Temple Mountain is the most impressive representation of the Baroque style of Khmer art. It was built on the model of a pyramid with three floors, with a total height of 43 meters, and is a veritable maze of stairways, towers, and terraces. The structure once had 54 towers, which represented, according to legend, the 54 provinces of the Khmer Empire. The first two levels, square and decorated with bas-reliefs, lead to the third, circular level, where strange towers with mysterious appearances stand. Brahma, generally represented with four heads looking in four different directions, is the creator god who made matter and the universe. The Bayon is a square structure of around 150 meters per side, and it is also surrounded by walls and gates. Inside the walls, a courtyard contains galleries, 16 chapels, and two libraries. The distinctive feature comes from these galleries, which were covered originally, the walls of which are covered with fabulous bas-reliefs that unfold across more than one kilometer, with more than 11,000 characters. These bas-reliefs relate the bloody exploits of the Khmer army from Angkor against the Cham, another rival Cambodian ethnicity. They also explain the daily life of the Khmer in the 12th century, with market, hunting, and fishing scenes, as well as duels and processions. While highly detailed, these bas-reliefs are not accompanied by any kind of text, so an uncertainty lingers over even the historical events that are represented. One scene in the Southern Gallery depicts a naval battle with Cham warriors in boats and dead Khmer fighters beneath the water. Another scene in the Southern Gallery shows a military procession in a forest with elephants. Further away, a naval battle on Tonle Sap, the great lake of the country. 
Beneath the confrontation between the Khmer and Cham forces, there are scenes of everyday life, showing a market, outdoor cooking, and hunters and gatherers. Another scene showing a melee amongst the Khmer evokes a civil war. Opposite there, in the Northern Gallery, other scenes show still more victories of the Khmer over the Cham. It should be mentioned that the site of Angkor Thom was built just after the victory of King Jayavaram VII over the Cham armies. So it's normal that the site extols the war feats of its ruler and builder. The Cham had in fact destroyed the first religious and royal complex here, and it is on these ruins that the Khmer built the one that still exists and we can visit today. Incidentally, one wall retraces the pillage of the original royal city in 1177. After crossing the courtyard, another gallery circles the temple. It is the interior gallery. Its bas-reliefs, made later, are additions by Jayavaram VIII and are a striking contrast with those of the exterior gallery. Instead of battles and processions, there are scenes from Hindu mythology, like the Apsaras here, who are celestial dancers. Here as well, there's no certainty as to what some panels represent or what relationships they could have between each other. The East Gallery, the pillars of which are also decorated with Apsara, is covered with the exploits of the Angkor army against that of the Cham, their hereditary enemies. On the walls, frescoes line the space, telling less bellicose stories. Another gallery holds a series of panels that show a king with his hands being examined by women after having battled serpents barehanded. Further on, we see the king lying down and sick. These images are related to the legend of the leper king, who contracted leprosy due to the venom from a serpent he fought with. Above these galleries, there's the upper terrace on which the famous face towers of the Bayon rest. It is a veritable labyrinth in which each square centimeter of stone is carved or sculpted. Here is an apsara, characterized by its sensual curves and rich trappings. It is said that they had 64 ways to awaken the senses and that thanks to their beauty, they were able to help the gods to ward off evil beings. Today, there are vestiges of only 37 of these towers, each of which was decorated with four faces illustrating the four virtues, sympathy, compassion, loving kindness, and equanimity. In total, that makes 216 enigmatic faces that scan the horizon, as if to guard the subjects of the empire to the far reaches of their territory. The central tower rises 43 meters above ground level. It stands against a temple tower that once housed a gigantic statue of Buddha that was nearly four meters high, but was demolished under the reign of Jayavaram VIII, who was Hindu. The ancient city of Epidaurus contained the sanctuary of Asclepius, the most famous site of Greek medicine. This site sheltered the best known doctors and here, as in all Greek sanctuaries, athletic and theatrical events were organized in honor of the gods. Remains of athletic equipment were found at Epidaurus, but the site is especially famous for its theater. 
The theater was built on a hill slope around 330 BC. Of all the ancient theaters, the theater of Epidaurus is the best preserved. Nearly all of the gray limestones are the actual originals. Only those on the wings have been restored. The stands are arranged in a hemicycle, with 55 rows separated into two levels by a corridor. Originally, the theater was made up of 34 rows of stands separated by 13 staircases. It seated up to 6,200 spectators. The upper level, added in the second century BC, numbers 21 rows, augmenting the theater's capacity to 12,000 spectators. It has been remarked that the number of seats on both levels, both 34 21sts and 55 34ths, refer to the golden ratio, 1.61. The circular orchestra, which held the actors, the choir, the dancers and musicians, lies in front of the quadrangular stage, whose substructure can still be seen. The theater of Epidaurus is especially famous for its acoustics. The slightest sound produced at the foot of the seats resounds all the way to the upper seats, located 22.5 meters above the orchestra. Since 1955, the annual Festival of Epidaurus takes place in this theater, performing the Greek tragedies of the ancient dramatists. Nafplio is the capital of Argolid, the eastern region of the Peloponnese. Occupied successively by the Byzantines, the Franks, the Venetians, and the Turks, who left their mark here, it has become a historical and touristic city with a population of about 15,000. Its ancient old town is quite charming with narrow streets full of bougainvilleas. You can sit at the terrace of a mezzadoplio, a tavern specialized in metzes, a variety of small dishes that go so well with ouzo, an alcohol made from aniseed. Nafplio perfectly illustrates the image of touristic Greece. Overlooking the town of Noplio, Palamidi is a fortress nestled on the crest of a hill rising 216 meters high. The fortress was built by the Venetians during their second occupation of the region, between 1686 and 1715, before being seized by the Turks for a hundred years. Two of the eight bastions that compose the fortified complex are still in good state. This one here was the residence of the garrison's chief. It includes a ramp that enabled them to haul cannons up to the fortifications. In the courtyard, a small church is devoted to St. Andrew. The site offers a magnificent view over the Argolic Gulf, the city of Nauplio, and the surrounding nature. It is the reward after climbing nearly a thousand stairs to reach the peak.
During the Turkish occupation, Turkish names were given to the eight bastions. But after the independence of Greece in 1822, each bastion was renamed after a Greek hero, like this one here, Themistocles. This bastion was used to defend the entire east side of the town. Previously, the city's only defense, Bordzi Fort guarded the entrance to the port. The Venetians had completed its fortification in 1473 to protect Noplio from pirates and invaders hailing from the sea. Once it became Greek once again, it was used as a fortress until 1865, before becoming a prison, then a hotel, from 1930 to 1970. Since then, it has become a tourist attraction that occasionally holds a music festival.